University, where I did my undergraduate degree. Uh, Joe did his undergraduate studies in theology at Birmingham Christian College in the UK. He earned his master's degree in mission theology at the U University of Manchester in, in the UK, and holds a PhD in Christian intellectual thought from WTS in Florida. A contributing author to Thomas Nelson's major Christian apologetics volume, Beyond Opinion, Joe's other apologetic works include Searching for Truth, I own that one, uh, Why I Still Believe, I own that one, and How Then Shall We Answer, I own that one too, <laughs> which have been published in Europe and North America. His most recent book, The Mission of God, which I also own, but hunt, I didn't buy that one, it was a gift from Joe. Um, that book, uh, as well as a systematic work of cultural theology exploring the biblical worldview as it relates to the Christian, Christian's mission to the world. Joe serves as senior fellow for the cultural and apologetics think tank Truth Exchange in Southern California. He's a senior fellow of cultural philosophy for the California-based Center for Cultural Leadership and serves as faculty for both the Wilberforce Academy in Cambridge, uh, UK, and in the Alliance Defending Freedoms Blackstone Legal um, and Theological, sorry, Legal Academy in Phoenix, Arizona, which is a phenomenal uh, Christian legal uh, academy. In 2011, Joe was recognized by Toronto Center for Mentorship and Theological Reflection as best preacher apologist for his contributions to apologetic and expository preaching. Joe is also the general editor of the Ezra Institute's journal named Jubilee, which is a really neat name because that's a church I attend here in Ottawa, it's also Jubilee. And he serves as chancellor for Westminster Classical Christian Academy. And he's regularly been heard on Toronto radio and seen on Sun News Network, including with such um, Luminaries as Michael Corrin. Do you wear that as a private? Uh, no? Okay. okay. Um, Joe lives in Canada with his wife Jenny and their three children, Naomi, Hannah, and Isaac. Please give a warm or ARPA welcome to the Reverend Pastor Joe Goose. Back in the uh, 1960s, uh, before I was born actually, as you can see, uh, movements began in, uh, in earnest to... ...from public schools in Canada, striking at the vulnerable soul, really, of the nation, seated at small tables to learn in their innocence. And in 1985, you will recall that in the name of the Charter, the last vestiges of public Christian identity were abolished in Ontario as the Lord's Prayer was banned as unconstitutional. Seems like an age ago now. The result, though, has been uh, the steady moral neutering of two generations, at least, and the casting adrift, in particular, of the human personality. And it has led to the absolutization of the feeling aspect of human experience, so that now, in a plastic world, it's probably most accurate to say, I feel, therefore, I am. I feel, therefore, I am. Under the influence of European radicals like Michel Foucault, we have been told there is no essential self. The human person and the human family are merely social constructs. We are only what we make and define ourselves to be. That's what we're told. And in such a cosmos, even grammar and pronouns must go because they remind us of laws 
and of norms, whereas man is a mere artifice and nothing more in the contemporary perspective. Now, by contrast to that, at the beginning of Scripture, we discover the most fundamental aspect of God's word revelation for granting a coherent and therefore intelligible vision of the human person. Genesis 1, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, there is actually no parallel to that starting point in human thought. The triune God of Scripture creates out of nothing all that is distinct from himself, and he makes the human person in his image where the I, that is the human ego, is established as a kind of transcendent reference point for all the aspects of our temporal human experience. As part of human experience, somehow, part of the uh, human condition, human nature, is that we transcend somehow nature. We're able to stand back from it, to analyze it. As Blaise Pascal so well understood, the human person is a mystery. Man transcends himself somehow and is only comprehensible in reference back to the living God as the source and origin of all life, law, truth, and meaning. And that's an essential basic statement of the human, of the Christian doctrine of man. Now this unique human identity and the critically important distinction between the creator and the creature implies something very important. First, a limit to the reach of human thought. And second, a limit to the legislative <coughs> prerogatives of man. And so we read in Ecclesiastes, as you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. Now the average person today has lost sight of the true nature of man and fallen prey to a kind of spiritual nihilism, a world of negation that children for at least a generation or more have been taught to embrace. As the great, perhaps the greatest of the Dutch philosophers, Herman Doyerwerd, put it regarding modern man, he says, and I quote, he has lost all his faith and denies any higher ideals than the satisfaction of his desires. To him, God is dead. Modern mass man has lost himself and considers himself as a popular culture. The singer, songwriter, poet, uh, Sting gives expression to the existential rootlessness of an ailing humanity. In one of his popular songs, this is what Sting writes, he says, You could say I've lost my faith in science and progress. You could say I lost my belief in the Holy Church. You could say I lost my sense of direction. You could say all of this and worse, but the romantic hope, if I ever lose my faith in you, there'd be nothing left for me to do. Some would say, I, lost, I am a lost man in a lost world. You could say, I lost my faith in the people on TV. You could say, I'd lost my belief in our politicians. They all seem like game show hosts to me. I could be lost inside their lives without a trace. But every time I close my eyes, I see your face, the romantic ideal again. I never saw no miracle of science that didn't go from a blessing to a curse. I never saw no military solution that didn't end up as something worse. But let me say this first, if I ever lose my faith in you. Now, apart from the bad grammar, you can see what uh, he's getting at. The result of this modern temper is that, the, the upshot of this is that perhaps there's never been a time in the past 1,500 years where Western man and the Western world faced a greater crisis of identity and thereby is confronted so dramatically by our own social and cultural ruin. 
I don't think that's in any way an, ex an exaggeration. An observant and thinking Christian can see that we are radically uprooted and dislocated as a generation and adrift in the world. Social and cultural philosophers, of course, and commentators, theologians, they've spilled all kinds of ink seeking to trace upstream to the fount of the problem following the various tributaries of the crisis. Much has been written on it to a common source, but not all have actually grasped the religious character of this subterranean spring. That is the decline of the human personality via apostasy of the heart of man from God and the consequent emergence of mass man. And by that I mean depersonalized, dispensable human beings. Raised in a technocratic society where the individual strives to find themselves without God. Not many actually perceive then that our present situation is so precarious that the elegy of Western culture is on the verge of being composed. And when we actually read daily our newspapers and our broadsheets and so forth, we find people in the grip of a radical relativism that is unimaginable even 25 years ago. As abstracted and generalized people reduced to self-created group identities, we no longer know what a human being is. This condition has advanced to such a degree that we are essentially unsure, as a society, if there are any human norms that transcend radical, autonomous desire and subjectivist self-identification. And I don't simply mean that the last vestiges of um, our pride and rootedness in our historical self-understanding as a Christian people are being eagerly eroded by the contemporary muses. They've been doing that for some time. It is that we no longer have a confidence in the intrinsic value of the human person made in the image of God, where the pre-born, newborn, disabled, aging, sick, or despairing. Indeed, we are so fundamentally uprooted that we are no longer assured of the scientific chromosomal reality of the binary gender distinctions of male and female, of normative human sexuality, or of the oldest institution known to the human race, marriage and the family. Our profound confusion is such today that some people are not even sure they occupy the right age group or gender, whether they were born into the right people group or even gestated by the right species since they feel like something else. <coughs> no one dare challenge these inner fictions since all that is left of the human personality is the notion that autonomous and subjective feeling has the absolute existence of God himself. As such, there is no longer a basis for differentiation of any objective kind. And this is what groups like ARPA Christian, and Christian apologists and groups like the CLF are up against. In a world of flux, of irrational fluidity to all things, where the possibility of normative differentiation between truth and falsehood, right and wrong, reality and unreality has collapsed. Culture hasn't just reached in our time a bump in the road, but has been sucked into a kind of vortex of democratic insanity, spiraling downward toward what Cornelius Van Til called disintegration into the void. Maybe it's not like that in all the farming communities, I grant, but that's the real world. In the world of cultural elitism today, this is the world we confront. In our disarticulated world, the vain rantings of Nietzsche's overmen, who've gone beyond good and evil, declared the reasonable in and sane to be sick, mad, or malevolent, and demand the voice of plain reason be silenced in the face of the cultural conjurers reimagining the world. The stark reality of our situation is that we've, we are facing the death of man as man. The death of man as man in the West. 
by denying, debunking, and defacing the image of God in man, we have lost our very soul. And the tragedy is that there are so many who do not yet realize it, and they will not do so till it's too late. Jesus Christ said, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? When iconoclastic and fractious man declares that what is left of human dignity is now rooted solely in radical autonomy from God, from revelation, from true human community, and all familial and moral obligation, we have realized the most fundamental depersonalization of all of life. Such a society, whatever its protest to the contrary, is actually antisocial to the core. Whilst, ironically, individual responsibility for action and its consequences is passed on to an impersonal, scientific society governed by statistics, bureaucracy, fashion, technology, social planning, and other impersonal forces. The socio-cultural deficit ensuing from this disaster cannot be fixed by any amount of state welfare or scientific planning. There is no technical solution to this colossal religious problem. I hope I'm cheering you up this evening. <laughs> In the state of crisis that results from the illusion of the creative freedom of selfhood, People are more often than not, at the same time, deeply inwardly afraid. Even as they revel in an autonomy that finds endless social indulgence and increasingly legal sanction. People on every side are gripped by sadness, guilt and despair that no amount of psychotropic prescriptions can finally ameliorate or truly heal. By such technique, the fear of disintegration and death is simply being suppressed. And psychotropic medicines are, after antibiotics, the most prescribed by doctors today. But as Doiverd also rightly noted, quote, it is, un it is uncomprehended revelation of God that fills humankind with fear and trembling. What did he mean? While we may deny God and man as his image bearer, we can try to kill both God and man as man. We may press ahead in a suicidal course, but it always proves to be pure vanity. For we are surrounded inside and out by the reality of God and his order in every sphere of life. We can't shake it off. This revelation may well be suppressed, but it's inescapable and it still grips the being of every person generating both guilt and deep disquiet. And actually, uh, much of what is taking place in our culture today in terms of the rationalization of sin is about the quest to alleviate the problem of guilt. Consequently, there is actually no recovery for our society till we will recognize that whatever gains we have made materially we have lost our soul, and Christ warns us there is a reckoning, for God is not mocked. What a man sows, he reaps. And we cannot bargain with God to get our soul back. What can we give in exchange for it? Our only recourse is true repentance, both personal and national. In the meantime, however, because we're certainly not there yet, our culture looks to political and indeed magical solutions to its ills because, as one Christian thinker puts it, the truth is so intolerable to fallen humanity that even when it does take hold of people, they still seek to escape its total claims in every possible way. And so we see Christians compromising in our culture into this increasingly pretentious and arrogantly overreaching world of political life, God has called groups like ARPA to be leaven, the leaven of Christ, to be salt and light, 
to serve God and minister life and hope to our fellow man, sometimes, if only at times, through a kind of prophetic witness to those in places of authority. In this task, Christians must recognise that all political life is shaped, like every other aspect of life, by the beliefs, or more properly, the religious worldviews of those who participate in it. And I've already described some of the fruits of the dominant worldview that increasingly shapes our culture. And I say religious worldview because man is a worshipping being. So Paul makes clear, doesn't he, in Romans 1, that if we refuse to worship the living, creator God, we do not cease to be worshippers. Rather, we worship some aspect of creation itself. Some thing or being will be absolutized and given the place of God. This the Christian calls idolatry which is an apostasy from the true God, finding its root in the human heart, and then it spreads out from there to touch everything, every aspect of life. Before renewal of a Christian view is possible, a self-conscious appreciation from where we have fallen is actually necessary. And that's a difficult proposition, even for the Christian church today. I know this as a pastor myself, how resistant we are how resistant Christians often are to facing the reality of our situation and condition, even as believers. Today we're actually in the grip of God's historical judgments, seen in our growing adherence to very ancient beliefs, dressed in a new outfit. Anthropologists actually in the past called them manner beliefs, which lay at the foundation of the disintegration of the human personality in pagan cultures. These beliefs are characterized by a supposed fluidity of reality between the personal and the impersonal. These are nature religions, if you will, for manna is a mysterious life force that underlies everything. Millions of people actually in our culture, often unwittingly, pay homage to such a life force from the yoga mat to the acup acupuncturist and alternative healer to the science classroom where nature is deified as an endless stream of life. And that spontaneously evolved from an original mysterious point of undifferentiated absolute unity. It was such a belief that filled the ancient Greco-Roman world with dread in the face of blind fate. And so promoted the nobility of suicide. A belief which is re-emergent now in our time. When nature itself in various ways, is absolutized, culture becomes increasingly decrepit because of all, because with all of nature being somehow an aspect of the divine, emerging from an original unity, how can real, meaningful differentiation take place at the level of the family, the level of biology, of ethics, of the arts, of juridical and jurisprudence, moral, or even the ontological level of reality. In such a view, man and his culture is simply impermanent artifice in a mysterious fluidity. And in the post-Darwinian world that we occupy today, we can no longer speak cogently or persuasively, at least to most people, of even natural law as a moral referent in the way that pseudo-Christian secularists of past generations did. Because in a world of mysterious, chaotic forces, we cannot, have, we cannot find objective or transcendent law. And so all that is left is the manner world of jurisprudence, of positive law, which emerges as a development of the reflective experience of the people, as uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., former Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court and a leading thinker, actually argued. That is, there is no law that transcends us. All we have is positive law that emerges out of people's experience. So the answer always, when there's a new pressure group wanting some other radical autonomy, is just wait it out until the experience of the people brings about the change. 
The question, the obvious question, is who it interprets? Who interprets the reflective experience of the people and transforms that experience into law? Well, of course, it used to be Parliament that was responsible for making laws, but now a new elite in our courts cut loose from accountability to God and Scripture's definition of man and his image bearer increasingly transform the society. The new elite, or this new humanistic priesthood, Plato's philosopher kings are necessary, of course, not that every justice perceives himself or herself in that way. Not all of these things are self-conscious, but that's the problem. They're necessary, of course, because social chaos is not a workable political philosophy. It's not practical. Humanity needs salvation from all those fatalistic forces threatening to crush it. Increasingly, our society looks to absolutize the cultural sphere of the state as the agency that should be able to control the threat that man, as an aspect of nature, is to himself. It is to the state that idolatrous man largely delegates his freedom today. It naturally follows that modern political doctrine, for many, present company accepted amongst our esteemed MPs, rests typically on a set of beliefs that flatly contradict what God says about humanity. And it's not that in political life we deny that there is evil in the world that needs to be addressed. But we locate that evil not in the heart of man, who is thought of as inherently good and perfectible by the average pagan today, but it's located in the environment and spheres of social order, like the family, the church, private property, and other structures of alleged inequality that supposedly war against the original unity that was man. Fairly recently, I was a fly on the wall, as it were, in a Labour Party committee meeting in uh, Parliament, the British Parliament, uh, during which they were analysing their serious defeat in the recent British elections, trying to understand why they were thrashed, as it were. And one MP uh, and a keynote speaker began his presentation by saying that the core problem is that the Labour Party needs a robust return to the conviction of the essential goodness of man. So he started badly, let's just put it that way, and it went downhill from there. And this illustrated the recurrent theological political illusion about the human person that we are born without sin, and so can change people by transforming the evil in society, by getting back to an unspoiled condition that humanity supposedly lived in in its primitive past, a past supposedly without inequalities. So if we abolish marriage and the family, no one will be subject to hierarchy anymore, and women and children will not feel subjugated. If we eliminate binary gender norms, no one will feel oppressed by distinctions anymore. If we eliminate income inequality, no one will be greedy anymore. If we open our borders and embrace Islamists returning from fighting with ISIS and find them work and housing, they won't want to crucify and behead Christians anymore or plot against our country. In this view, human beings are perfectible by political technique. A technocratic culture, a repackaged world of magic. We've dropped some of the primitive terminology, but it's the same basic idea. Our unfallen nature, in this erroneous view, is not fixed. It's plastic. It's malleable. We are not beings made in God's image who have fallen into sin and idolatry, who need to be restrained from evil by revealed moral law and renewed by Jesus Christ and God's Holy Spirit. In fact, we are so malleable, we may become transhuman or post-human. These are 
movements today that not only redefine ourselves, but intend to evolve to merge with our own technology, to become cyborgs of a sort, if you will. And this is serious stuff. This is funded by very serious people with very serious amounts of money. In fact, I was just reading about a group of researchers, I believe the work is now being done in India, where they've been uh, locating um, patients who are on life support, who are technically brain dead, uh, to be held, to be kept alive in stasis and have various stem cells injected into their cerebral cortex to see if they can be revived in some way. This is a world of political and technocratic magic resting on manner beliefs that hold we can abolish sin, guilt, poverty, disease, indolence, ignorance, hunger, and even death itself, so long as God and man as his image bearer can be removed as the essential roadblock. The key obstacle is hierarchy, except the privilege belonging to the new cultural elite, because the principle of hierarchy is a reminder of the distinction between man and God. If all hierarchies are leveled, it is thought, God is brought down to the level of man, and man is raised up to the level of God. If the authority of families, of parents, of churches, of pastors, of private businesses, guilds and associations are eroded, if, if we can abolish all true authority outside the state and its legislative apparatus that authoritatively interprets the experience of the people, perhaps we can abolish the God who stands behind and over all legitimate authority. Critically, centralization and massive political power must be accrued to the state in order to do this. Interesting to have President Obama lecturing the British on staying in Europe recently, something that the United States itself would never countenance. <laughs> this path, it is held, is true liberation for the human personality. As a cultural theologian, Andrew, San Andrew Sandlin has summarized it, and I quote, liberals, by which he means progressive, since the French Revolution have engaged in one massive liberation project that has been called the Oppression Liberation Nexus. The liberal religion has become one of never-ending clawing for the liberation of humanity from every tyranny, real or imagined. The secularists must be liberated from the religionists, the parishioners from the clergy, the enlightened from the unenlightened, the citizens from royalty, the poor from the rich, the workers from the capitalists, blacks from whites, women from men, wives from husbands, children from parents, debtors from creditors, employees from employers, homosexuals from heterosexuals, convicts from law-abiding citizens, and soon, if the trajectory persists, polygamists from monogamists and pedophiles from prison guards. The great liberation now extends even to non-human nature, the liberation of the environment from rapacious humanity." End quote. The social cost and destructiveness of this autonomous liberation project is beyond, actually, full comprehension at the present time, and the welfare states of Europe and increasingly North America are buckling under the financial reality of this counterfeit exodus. Now I'm going to draw my thoughts to a conclusion, although I can see you're enjoying this so much, I would rather not stop, but let me wrap, begin to wrap this up in the next few minutes. If we have adequ adequately learned anything by now in our historical experience, it should have been that our rejection of God and the image of God in man leads to the endless defacing and destruction of that image and the steady decay of diverse cultural life as the sphere of the state overreaches itself to try and play a messianic role in people's lives because of all the mess. As man kills himself as God's image bearer, he languishes in the ruins of a social order that cannot find a solution to its malady from within nature itself. Simply put, human beings cannot be remade or renewed by technique and will never be perfected 
until Christ establishes his kingdom in all its fullness. The contemporary religious illusion that the human ego has the same absolute existence as God is a direct succumbing to the original lie proffered to our first parents. You will be as gods. In both seeking himself, that is his identity, and his God in the temporal world of experience, modern man has lost himself in the abyss by absolutizing that which is in fact relative, and that which is comprehensible actually only in reference back to our Creator, and specifically in the person of Jesus Christ. And this incalculable loss and radical spiritual uprooting is the foundation of our current crisis that presently shows no sign of abating. What is the Christian answer? Well, in clear contrast to contemporary political illusions, Scripture actually tells us that the human eye, the human person, is nothing in and of itself, but truly lives only in reference to the creative power and defining word of God. Indeed, true knowledge of ourselves is dependent as John Calvin made clear, on true knowledge of God. We can't really know ourselves unless we know God. The foundation of all true knowledge of God is right relationship with God. (coughs) In short, the love of God. That's why the first commandment is to love the Lord our God with heart, mind, soul, and strength. And since... This is the way God is loved. His image bearer will be loved of necessity as well. That's the reason for the second commandment, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Nowhere in the Christian view can such a love lead to the destruction of that image in gender-fluid confusion, the redefinition of God's creation and institution of marriage, or the murder of our neighbor in the womb, or in age, sickness, or despair in the name of autonomy and human dignity. The simple truth is that without love to God, without actually a recognition of his word revelation to us in Christ and in Scripture, we are not only unable to truly love our neighbour, we can't identify our neighbour for what they are, for who they are. We find, in fact, that we cannot answer the most elementary question. What is a human person? That's the question our culture seems unable to answer today. Again, I think it's Herman Doiver who comes to the heart of the matter. He says, the question, what is man? Who is he? Cannot be answered by man himself. However, it's been answered by God's word revelation, which uncovers the religious root and center of human nature in its creation, fall into sin, and redemption by Jesus Christ. Man lost true self-knowledge when he lost the true knowledge of God. But all idols of the human selfhood, which man in his apostasy has devised, break down when they are confronted with the word of God which unmasks their vanity and nothingness. It is this word alone which, by its radical grip, can bring about a real reformation of our view of man and of our view of the temporal world. Now, in possession of this word and a true knowledge of God and of the human person, we are actually enabled to pursue and build true culture and true community. With a transcendent referent for life, and thought. Political reality can proceed faithfully in its sphere on the basis of a true understanding of the life of humankind. That true word reveals human beings are not merged or collapsed with divinity, a primitive life force where law and social order are merely an emergent property of nature, manifest through man where history has to be captured by the new man-gods to create a world community in Tennyson's Parliament of Man. That idolatrous vision requires coerced collectivization in an attempt to realize community. But in the process, it only undermines both true community as well as destroys the individual. 
As one cultural theologian notes, the more social distinctions are denied, the more force is required in society to bring men together. And the more force prevails in society, the less communion. In the Christian view, true community and communion rests on an inner bond. The grace of God and loyalty to God and his life and freedom bringing word. I think that in pursuit of a true political life, ARPER is at the vanguard, and groups like ARPER are at the vanguard. It may seem to some degree at times relatively insignificant, but it isn't. You're dependent on God's grace and the working of the Holy Spirit as we seek to oppose and to defeat an apostate and destructive religious worldview that is ruining people's lives, ruining families, destroying children, and now wants the most liberal death laws in the world. We are called to this task to love and thoughtful obedience, and we can actually, despite the sobriety of this uh, presentation, be confident of victory in the long run in this battle because an apostate culture of death has no future. What we are doing in our culture today has no future. It is suicidal. And the question will simply be who is going to remain faithful to rebuild in the time of God's grace and remembrance. We must continue to pray for those in authority, to serve the cause of Christ, which encompasses the good of our fellow men, to the best of our ability, to prophetically witness against idolatry in its varied forms, and serve the cause of righteousness and justice wherever we are able to do so. We will not always be loved for this stand. In fact, the reality is that we may be hated by some. But this is the victory that overcomes the world, the Apostle John says, even our faith. With an apostate heart for almost a century, our culture has been progressively pursuing the death of man as man, that is, as God's image bearer. And so in that respect, we are surrounded by dead men, dead in trespasses and sins. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, I assure you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear shall live. Jesus Christ is life and that is our confidence. challenging message, dire times, but also uh, ending with gospel. Uh, looking forward to, um, to a comfort uh, that we all uh, share and know and have confidence in. Um, one of the things that we like to talk about is that we have a calling to be salt and light, and certainly the darker the room or the dark, darker the night, the brighter the light shines. And, uh, and I certainly look around um, this room and have uh, a lot of confidence that certainly this this light here is burning brightly so thank you very much for the the challenging talk and uh, again a warm uh, thank you for the i'd like to uh, close the evening with a, a word of prayer and then we're going to uh, sing as is our tradition we'll sing O canada both verses they'll be on the screens on either side um, but let's first uh, a word of prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.